final session, strong finish. You have all chosen wisely. Congratulations. Um, as a thank you, right after this session, we are offering cocktails. None of the other sessions did that for you, so you be the judge. <laughs> Who's really the best session of the day? <laughs> That's what we're talking about. So I want to welcome everyone. We're doing Growing Your Business, the Importance of Success-Based Marketing, Paid, Owned, and Earned, Finding and Applying the Insights and Integration. The great thing is this is something that we've kind of heard throughout the um, summit, and so it's a great springboard for the strong finish that we have here and then sending everybody back to their offices with a lot of great insight and great information. You know, we talk a lot about what the integration model looks like now, and the reality is here we are. Here we are. So we're going to have a great panel. We're going to have Nadine is going to be kicking us off right after a couple of opening words. Then we're going to have Lucas. And then Katie is actually from the UK government, and she is going to have a great case study for us. So, you know, as we look at how these all apply and being able to take those practical application tips to, into a great case study before we have some Q&A. Hopefully that will be helpful for everyone. I'm Jonna Burke, I'm the CMO of Varelsley. And um, in case you didn't get on the previous slide, we wanted to really hit that point home. So <laughs> anybody still questioning, we'll put it up again if you'd like. Um, but ultimately what we have here is, I like to try to kind of do things visually easy. I'm sure everybody is, you know, has a real appetite for probably as many more slides as you can get in today. But I'm gonna disappoint you from this perspective in that I just wanted to go through and kind of take a visual cue, and this is courtesy of our friends at Adobe, of what the market <coughs> is like right now for PR, communications, and marketing professionals. This is a little bit of the mentality that we're probably all comfortable, that we're all seeing in the marketplace. Peter, come take a look at this. Mr. Daniels, look at this. What's this? The numbers, they keep getting bigger and bigger. The clicks are off the charts. Yeah. Yoshi, it's Walter. We're back. Yes, sir! I loves that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly the target market that they're really trying to go for, isn't producing a lot of the insights, but business decisions, believe it or not, are being made on those low level metrics. And so what we're trying to do is to elevate that conversation and get people to a place where they're having a broader perspective of how things translate, work together, across all of their communications mediums. Because I think, even though that's where the PR community is, that's what makes, when we come into the room, to talk about what it looks like, about integration and frameworks, and now with you know new mapping, to a certain degree in a lot of the market, we're still getting kind of that blank stare, because this is what it looks like to them. And that's the moment they've been introduced to the Amec mapping. <laughs> they've seen behind the wall, they see how it can work, and it's no longer a quizzical mystery, but it's something that can all make sense to them. 
that's really the target, and that's what we're hoping, and that's why as the introduction of the mapper goes live, we hope that all of the members and all of you attending will take those concepts back to your teams, we'll talk to them about what this looks like for you, and make this a part of the everyday conversation because it will really make it easier. Because without that, as a guiding post to what we're doing, it's going to be very easy for some of these other big data companies as they want to talk about, especially as we allow marketing to control that conversation, to come in and give life to a whole new AVE. Because imitation and flattery are not always productive and can be very confusing, so we need to avoid that. All right, you're welcome. And now I want to turn the time over to Nadine. Nadine? A very good afternoon to you all, and thank you so much for staying on until the last session of the summit. When Barry first shared his idea for this workshop with me, I was thinking about how I could interpret the brief. And I thought it would be really interesting, actually, to look at this topic in two ways. On the one hand, in terms of how marketing can grow your brand, but also how measurement organizations are increasingly working with not only the communications teams, but also the marketing teams. So I'd like to explore both those angles today. Before we kick off, can I just have a very quick show of hands? How many people do we have here who work in PR, in-house or agency? Okay, and how many marketing folks do we have? Ah, okay, good. Right, traditionally PR and marketing are actually quite siloed and very defined functions. But because of the way brands are now adopting their social media platforms, the lines between PR and marketing are bec becoming blurred. If we look at the traditional roles of marketing and PR, marketing supports the sales team and handles advertising, PR supports the larger brand and handles press. So the biggest difference really is that PR is focused on maintaining a positive reputation for the overall brand, and marketing handles promoting and selling. But you can't really market without doing a little PR, and you can't do PR without a little marketing. So the end goals, selling products and maintaining a positive reputation for your brand, are actually quite intertwined. If you have a terrible product, people probably aren't going to have a very positive view of your company, but if people aren't engaging with your brand, they're unlikely to be buying your products. And I think social is where these two items really come together, where these two worlds come together. In terms of ownership of social, I think depending on the organization, this can either sit within PR or it can sit within marketing. And it can quite comfortably sit within both, because if we think about it, shared interactions are actually earned. And earned media is now seen as the most influential form of marketing. So let's focus a little bit on content marketing. Over the last couple of years, we've really seen a, a destruction of trust and confidence because of Brexit and the larger fake news issues, the U US presidential campaign, as well as the recent Cambridge Analytica scandal. So those of us who work on image and reputation really have a challenging road ahead. And because of this break of trust, and also because we live in an age of influence, advice from friends and family is increasingly shaping our opinion and driving our purchasing decisions. So now is actually the best time ever to focus on third-party endorsement by trusted and credible experts. Really partner with third-party experts, build relationships with influencers, and make thought leaders part of your content strategy. But how do you find the best ambassadors for your brand? I'd like to share with you an example from one of our clients. And this is actually a project where we work directly with the marketing team, not the communications team. We use our market intelligence tool, which uh, essentially is a combination of algorithms that searches all digital content and then looks at the intersection of relevant content of all the topics, entities, and attributes. Say a company wants to be viewed as being dynamic, fun, and family-oriented. How would they typically go about finding out if that's actually how the public sees them? They would use market research. But conducting surveys is actually a very lengthy process. It's quite expensive, so it can't be done very frequently. 
With this tool, we were able to identify that our client is doing very well in being seen as young, dynam dynamic and fun, but actually when it comes to being family oriented, there's a little more work to do. So we advised them on working with an ambassador who's associated with being family oriented. So what we did is we, in the category here, you can see that uh, there's a wide range. So you can choose an athlete, a musician, an actor or an influencer. We went with an athlete here. We selected the family oriented attribute and then we looked at the semantic profiles and the best matches. And what we came up with here is, uh, is Roger Federer at the end. So this is something that can be run quite regularly, both to partner, to find partners for your brands, but also to see if your, if your brand's self-image matches what the public sees. Finally, I'd like to share a um, case study with you. This is a, um, I think this shows quite well how Prime used thought leaders to amplify our own marketing strategy and brand. This was a joint project between Prime and Oxford University's Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. This project won gold for best measurement of a public sector campaign at last year's Amec Awards. So how did we partner with the Reuters Institute? The Reuters Institute's mission is to adapt academic research and connect it to industry challenges. And actually this goes a little bit back to Prime's roots because when we started out 30 years ago, what we did is we investigated how the media was influencing political campaigns and elections. So this was a really good match then to look at the biggest news story of 2016 in the UK, the EU referendum, and look at how the media influenced the outcome of that referendum. So we teamed up, we had a number of objectives that were set out at the very beginning of the campaign, both for the Reuters Institute as well as ourselves. I won't go down now, we don't have too much time left, but um, what I'd like to do is just very quickly share some of the outcomes with you because it was a very successful campaign. You can download it, there's a link down there if you go to the Reuters Institute's uh, website. It's actually the second most downloaded study on their website. And we had very good reception of this campaign. We were covered in the international press. In fact, The Guardian and The Independent featured us in their media sections and that both for the Reuters Institute as well as for Prime is really influential in terms of our target audiences. So that was a very good result. In terms of engaging journalistic and academic communities, we did very well there. We had a number of events globally. The University of Sydney put on an event. We also held a keynote at the uh, European Parliament in London where we presented our findings. This was actually as part of Measurement Month 2016. And what came out there is that government institutions were really engaging with the results. So we were really contributing to, to good and meaningful debate there. So the, the Reuters Institute really ticked all of the boxes there. When we look at Prime's objectives, really we wanted to wear, raise awareness for a, new, um, for a new division within our company, the, um, the Prime Policy Research Center. And that's something that we did quite successfully. We launched a Brexit briefing following this, uh, the, the, this study. And um, because of all the coverage that we received, not just on a global level, but also on a local level, particularly in Oxford, we had some uh, items featured on local radio stations in Oxford. It really helped to engage the local communities and raise awareness for Prime Research as an employer. And as a result of that, we were able to minimize what we spent on recruitment because all of a sudden we had an upswing in job applications coming in. And on top of that, obviously, it did affect our bottom line as well in terms of, uh, in terms of new contracts won in that particular sector. Um, as I say, we don't have too much time to go into it now, but uh, you can download the study there. In fact, we've got a second study coming up very shortly. This is now looking at European media, not just the UK press and uh, it's being launched at the beginning of July and we'll do another keynote address in West Westminster as well, again at the, uh, at the European Parliament in London. Thank you very much. Hi guys. Oh. I know it's late and uh, you're all probably hoping for a high energy presentation, um, but I'll be talking a bit about Fawcett. <laughs> well, more specifically, I wanna talk you through uh, Infomedia's take on an innovative client approach to um, finding and applying data-driven insights uh, from integration. Oh, just quick. First of all, I, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, by the raise of hands, 
How many can tell me what, what brand of faucet you have at your household? Okay. okay. So that's somewhat 10%. So our research actually shows that 80% of consumers are totally brand indifferent when it comes to choosing uh, a mega faucet, a faucet. So it's pretty much a potato potato scenario for our client, um, which underlines the, the problematic um, situation they're facing, they're facing at the moment. Um, so a bit about the client. The client is, uh, our client is the mixer. It's a sub, uh, sub brand to uh, Scandinavia's leading producer and distributor of, uh, of faucet. Um, in addition to the, to the brand indifference I, I mentioned uh, just before, they are, <laughs> they are faced with uh, increased competition from strong German brands. <laughs> <laughs> this is a German bodybuilder named Gunther. I don't know if you're familiar with, with him. And uh, they are faced with increased competition from uh, Asian discount brands. Um, in addition to that, they were suffering from a somewhat tarnished brand reputation uh, caused by some quality issues in the Nordies. And they found it difficult to navigate the media landscape. So to sum up, they commissioned Infimedia to map the competitive business landscape, to uh, develop an analysis and evaluation framework, and to reposition the brand accordingly. So in order to do so, we needed a strategy, oh, gee. we needed a fully integrated analysis setup. Um, so we needed a research structure that was capable of encompassing the, the somewhat ex extensive task and furthermore stand the test of time. So we went with uh, a pyramid and a wheel. Um, whereas uh, the wheel was, or the invention of the wheel was instrumental in building the great pyramid, uh, Mr. McNamara's pyramid of PR research was instrumental in developing the EIF, <laughs> both of which were used throughout this project. Um, Mr. McNamara's pyramid was used as a meta model where we did a, a threefold uh, analysis approach, the first of which was uh, formative evaluation, where we did baseline analysis. Um, based on that, we, uh, the client conducted or created new content for the, the primary communication channel, which we tested in the, the second phase, the uh, process evaluation. And uh, the final phase will be the summative uh, evaluation, where we will uh, hopefully uh, show some progress uh, in terms of brand position. Um, so using the, uh, the integrated evaluation framework, <laughs> we naturally set out small objectives uh, at the outset, and we used uh, or measured across all four uh, PESO media. So elaborating a bit on the, the measurement design of the formative evaluation, as I said before, it's a threefold uh, setup based on uh, media content analysis with uh, consumer uh, market research and a stakeholder analysis. And what we found was in this space, uh, the conjunctive relationship between these types of analysis created an uh, integrated research sweet spot where we went from, uh, <coughs> from being able to deliver information to deliver, uh, being able to deliver knowledge to the client. So lessons learned. This is uh, we did a deep dive into the two primary primary communication channels. Um, the first of which were, was uh, the Facebook Facebook page. Um, here we found is it pointer? Yeah, okay. So here we found that uh, the customer focus was was skewed, meaning that this uh, campaign they ran in, in March 17 was targeting uh, men aged 34 to 65, but the actual receiver of the campaign was uh, predominantly women. The next, uh, the next big eye-opener for the client was, uh, was this finding. Here we did a cross-channel analysis between uh, the Facebook, uh, Facebook page and the website, and we actually found that the two primary channels of communication were cannibalizing each other, so there was a statistic correlation throughout the entire year. So whenever they carried out communication, uh, communicational activities on one channel, it actually um, hurt the other. Mm. 
the uh, consumer market research. So we conducted a questionnaire, um, including 525 um, respondents. So we looked into the uh, into the stakeholders. Uh, oh no, sorry, that's the wrong one. Oops. No, we, look, we looked into uh, to aided awareness. So here we found that there was a high brand awareness, actually the highest brand awareness uh, among all. But nonetheless, two out of three consumers were not going to, to choose the mix safe. They were going to buy a new faucet. So this naturally told us that we, were, we ought to look more into this group of people because the basic um, brand, brand awareness was, was present and we, we needed to, to alter um, the perception of the brand in order to, to turn it into an actual conversion. So what we did was we looked into uh, segment orange um, and did a detailed uh, segmentation profile uh, of, of these people, um, allowing the, the, the client to, to target more specifically and, and going directly after the most um, sought after client or, or, or segment. So the final Final analysis of threefold analysis, analysis uh, framework was uh, the stakeholder analysis. So here we found that there was vast gaps between their own brand perception and how consumers uh, per perceived the brand. Um, so their own USPs did not correlate with consumers or the primary uh, purchase parameters of consumers. And they actually, they didn't like themselves very much. Uh, we, we did a a brand perception matrix where we asked all employees at, uh, at the mixer to rate themselves uh, on, on four different parameters. The first of which, price and quality, uh, and the second, uh, design and functionality. And as evident, they, they, they don't have very high uh, <laughs> um, thoughts about themselves. So in th the reason we included this was they, they needed to, to perceive themselves differently in order to com communicate it externally. So this was, uh, oh, I'm out of time, sorry. Uh, okay, so wrapping up. So the, the client initially believed that the brand just needed a bit of dusting, but after the first uh, formative evaluation, they, they realized that it was a much larger journey they were on. Um, the brand perception was, was different to consumers. The primary channels were cannibalizing one another, uh, and the market and customer focus was skewed. So what the, this report did um, was to provide a, a foundation upon which they, 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 could, they could embark. That is. So in a true UK government style, I am choosing the lecture standard, <laughs> which we've had many a giggle about while we were setting up. Um, <laughs> So yeah, just thought I'd get that, get that out there. Um, but yeah, what I'm here to talk about, tackling child abuse and neglect is all of our responsibility really. Um, and that's the premise of the England wide campaign that I'm gonna be presenting today. So this idea that it's everyone's responsibility that yes, there are local stakeholders, councils, family services who provide that uh, provision and support. Um, but actually we've all got a duty to look after the most vulnerable people in society. Um, and I'll be highlighting through this study how the core principles of planning effective public information campaigns um, with evaluation and insight at their heart, as you've seen um, Alex Aiken talk very passionately about, is, is what UK government comms is, is now striving to be um, defined by. Um, and that it's really about making a positive impact on the lives of, of citizens, and in particular the most vulnerable, um, such as children and young people. Um, it's fundamentally a behaviour change campaign, um, so supporting the government of the day's ambition is what we're about um, in government communications. Um, and in many ways that's what makes our role unique and also challenging. Um, and I'll discuss the challenges of that as we go through, um, and Paloma from, from UNICEF touched on some of those, you know, how you actually um, measure activity that doesn't have that straightforward transactional um, kind of call to action. So it won't be a surprise to you that OASIS is our starting point um, for any of you that heard Alex's um, session on that. This is a series of steps that we use to bring order and clarity to UK government campaigns and it will be the basis from which I uh, use as a framework to talk through the presentation. Um, but kind of 
more back to basics than that, really. I suppose operating in UK government comms, our um, internal client, if you like, um, is the uh, policy team that we're working to try and support. Um, so we really need to get under the skin of what their policy issue is um, in order to help them with sort of robust communications objectives rather than having communications as an add-on or a side project. Um, and at times that means a really honest conversation about what communications can and cannot achieve. Um, and I think through the presentations that I've heard here at this conference, that's a reoccurring theme that I think we all have to continually ask ourselves. Um, and in our case, it's, it's about understanding the role of communications as one of the four main levers of government. So alongside legislation, regulation and taxation, what's the role of communications within that? Um, and in, in this case, the policy issue was highlighting that high profile and often historic cases of child um, sexual abuse and neglect um, were highlighted in England where we were failing children, um, sadly, either because of a lack of awareness of what constitutes child abuse and neglect or because um, in a more sinister way because um, of people covering it up. And in 2016, the government committed to a communications campaign alongside far-reaching uh, system reforms to, to tackle that. Um, and phase one of the campaign was relatively su successful at starting that conversation um, about what abuse looks like and the, what the barriers to reporting were. However, it was pretty obvious that if we were going to be successful at it, it wasn't just going to be a one hit. Um, we needed to be truly transformational um, to change activity and make our comms work really hard to normalise um, the act of reporting itself if we were to protect people. And that meant moving away from awareness raising into more of an action-based campaign. Um, and specifically, we needed to uh, help people identify the complex signs of abuse and neglect, educate on where to make a report, challenge public perception that certain behaviours um, can sometimes be seen as the failings of a child rather than systematic of abuse, Reassure people that a report you make is only one part of a bigger jigsaw. Reassure people that it's okay to discuss their concerns and reassure people that your report can actually be anonymous. So in 2017, we launched phase two of the campaign to help the public spot um, the signs of abuse and neglect and encourage them to report their concerns to their local um, children's services, ultimately to try and enable more, more children to get help more quickly. And specifically, our campaign aimed to increase the number of local authorities delivering the campaign, so advocate, double the number of visits to our campaign page, educate, and increase the percentage of people who claim to report suspicions um, action. And critical to that task, of course, was understanding and revisiting the audience insight that we had from phase one. Um, and we used a variety of tools to do that. So pre and post online tracking surveys with the likes of YouGov, um, findings from quantitative and qualitative research, um, really designed to benchmark and get to the heart of uh, people's motivations to report um, and likelihood of reporting. Uh, focus groups to test positive creative routes and continue to use that as a check-in to make sure that what we were producing was resonating, routing consultations with partners and key influencers, so local council representatives and the top five children's charities, um, and target group index data to make sure that our audience insight and marketing decisions were sound in terms of the media we were using. And the core insight for phase one were parents aged 25 to 44. And in phase two, we had a renewed emphasis to focus in on those people who we really worried were not reporting. Um, and using our media budget, a very slim media, media buying budget, we had to, um, we felt that was a sensible approach to make sure that we got more bang for our buck. Um, so the, the newly defined segment um, had uh, 20 to 40 year old parents with children aged 0 to 9. And they had the following characteristics. So these quotes here were quite um, typical of their type of attitude towards reporting. Um, what they were feeling. They were highly conscious of their own parenting and keen not to judge others. Um, unlikely to um, report individual signs of, of, of abuse. And if, if they were concerned, they'd maybe try to tackle it head on rather than report it to an authority. And they obviously had widespread awareness of, of um, some of the historical um, child abuse cases that were coming to light. 
But more broadly than that, we had a huge range of stakeholders and partners that we needed to keep active and advocate on our behalf and bring with us on this journey. Um, many of them included charities, voluntary and community groups, um, and a key, a key sort of challenge for us was whilst knowing that we needed to galvanise them and keep them active um, in, to, in order to kind of live and breathe the campaign with us on our journey, um, in terms of measurement, they didn't always have the same call to action, so we had to be quite mindful of competing with them on messages when we're trying to operate and support um, each other in the same space. So moving on to strategy, um, our strategy was based on one simple idea, making it easier to take that first step. Um, and a key challenge remained across phase one to phase two, and that was that increasing the percentage of those who said they'd take action um, by acting on a suspicion, the suspicion was quite a challenge. I think making an official, official report sounds like quite a big step and we needed to break those barriers down. So we needed our campaign and its tactics to shorten the reporting gap um, from people having that first suspicion and taking an action on it if we were to keep more children safe. And this was um, our, our kind of reporting journey um, across see, consider, decide, and act. And what we found was that the biggest dwell time was around people considering and acting, which you can understand it's, it's, a, it's a big decision in people's eyes to, to make that report. So we knew from that what we needed our campaign to do was two critical things if it was to be successful. We needed to make our audience feel that they should take action when they see those signs, so normalizing reporting. And we may, needed to make sure that when they do take action, they receive the right um, support and information for the stage of their journey that they're at. But critically, there was almost a third stage to this, um, and that's around this continual need for reassurance um, and being active and operating in, in the media spaces where, um, where our audience is present because after all, um, it, it, it could be some time before you need to actually take that call to action. And moving on to implementation. So to meet the ask, we selected media that was present in our audience's everyday world. Um, we had out of home, digital and radio advertising. We had a free digital toolkit for partners um, to encourage them to come on this journey with us. We had an online quiz um, provided by Playbuzz we had an educational partnership with England wide utility companies who gave us extra eyes and ears on the ground. We had a dedicated campaign website, um, which for those of you that know government communications, that's a big deal, deviating from sort of the standard formats. Um, we had social media, we had stakeholder engagement, and we had um, a national media moment to hold it all together. And moving on to our score, um, we continually measured effectiveness as we went along using monthly dashboards such as this one. We drew insight from channel anal analysis, so establishing metrics and using pre-wave um, audience surveys as our starting point, as I say, just to make sure that we were continually checking in and making sure that we were aware of how we were doing. And across only a seven-week burst of activity, we had some real positive success across outputs, out outtakes and outcomes, and in particular tracking back to our objectives uh, we had 125 councils supporting, so that's roughly 82% of local councils in England being involved in the campaign. We had 70% of people feeling confident or very confident about reporting having seen our advertisement. We had uh, 80,000 views of our campaign webpage um, and 124,000 views of um, our, uh, quite a bold move for us as a government department doing an online quiz. Um, and a key learning for that was um, obviously taking our information to where people are already engaged and active is the right thing to do. But a big evaluation challenge was, was around organisational impact and thinking about what our role was of the campaign was. Um, and again, Paloma touched on this um, when she talked about her work with UNICEF. Um, we know from Children in Need data held by the department that increased referrals on child abuse and neglect fluctuate significantly and they're subject to a whole range of external factors which we have no control over, so health, schools, police, um, local council practice and levels of need. And we needed to be really mindful and very honest about that um, with policy colleagues and ministers 
in terms of what we could achieve. We didn't want it as the sole measure um, attributable to the campaign because unlike marketing a product or service, it could be days, months, or even years before someone needed to take action on our, um, on our call to action. Rather, what we sought to measure was the curve of change, clearly linking back to our objectives around people's propensity to report. So this ensured that should need arise, the campaign was fulfilling um, a space of equipping more people with, with the confidence to report year on year should need arise. And the number of people capable of recognizing the signs to spot was also a really important one for us. And again, backed by the advocacy, um, the high advocacy numbers, numbers of the local councils who showed support also showed that we were going somewhere to, um, at, a, at a government level, really get to the heart of locally what um, they needed to deliver on the ground. And I just want to end with a short clip just to summarise the um, journey of the campaign so far and give you a real flavour of how audience insight, focus groups, message testing um, and channel effectiveness and a real commitment to review and refresh as we go along as part of our Oasis model led to quite a radical shift as you're seeing on the, on the uh, screen right now for phase three which is now live and active um, and showing signs of outperforming all other phases. Um, as you can see, moved much more away from out of home advertising in terms of how we can measure and track its effectiveness um, and much more into a social media space where we knew families and parents were active. Um, and there's just a short clip now. Spot the signs of sexual abuse. Appearance. Behaviour. <gasps> Communication. That head. That head is. Oh. Think appearance, behaviour, communication. Child abuse. If you think it, report it. To find out how, visit gov.uk forward slash tackle child abuse. Thank you. was amazing, right? Um, you know, oftentimes we look at a lot of PR and, you know, we can get jaded of, you know, what we're really doing in these campaigns that we're working on. But I mean, to be able to end and to see something that's so impactful and making such a huge difference in the most fragile lives in our society is a whole different perspective that I think we're all so fortunate to be able to take that with us as a means to be able to carry that on. So thank you so much for sharing that. That was amazing. I'll start off with a couple of questions for the panel, and then I will turn it over to the runners in the audience for some mics for some questions from the audience. I'll start out with Nadine. Nadine, you mentioned in your presentation that you're starting to see you know, that the silos are breaking down and that mm -hmm. people are working across all channels. What are some of the successes that we're seeing, and what are some of the pitfalls for people if they kind of try to go in too fast and too hard without kind of understanding that ecosystem within their organization. I think the lines between PR and marketing are blurring, but unfortunately the silos continue to exist. So I wish I could say, oh, it's all fantastic, everybody works together, communications, marketing, it's all one happy family, but I don't think we're there yet. So there's still quite a long road to go. And I think some of the dangers, if you have, say you have social media within the marketing team, and you work with the communications teams, one of the risks there is, well, it's one of two things, really, because either you're going to completely exclude social from your program, and I think in 2018, we all know that in order to do meaningful analysis, you have to go cross-channel. You can't exclude social. Or if you include it, it means you're duplicating effort, so it's going to be costing the client much, and then if you compare what's being done within the communications and the social teams and the marketing teams, There'll be different methodologies, the metrics won't match, and it will actually raise more questions than answers. Great, great. I think those are all good lessons that we can take away and take back to each of our clients. Lucas, in your presentation, you, you know, showed all of the data, and obviously for everybody who was in the GDPR session earlier, you guys are really focusing in on how to capture that data, how to be really relevant and credible, which is an amazing to be a leader in that space. 
Was there an option to be able to look at what that sales data was so that you could see some of that attribution for the client in this particular case? And how did you kind of navigate that with them as they're sometimes a little bit stingy with that information? Yes. We, we actually thought about combining it to this summative evaluation to combine sales data with the, um, the data I described uh, earlier. Um, but no, not, not in the formative evaluation stage. We, we, we chose to focus on three main areas of analysis um, in order to, to, as I said, map the position in the minds of consumers and the media and, uh, of course, their own perception of their brand. So, but yeah, in, in, in the long term, we're going to include other types of data as well uh, to get a more holistic picture. Uh, perfect, perfect. Katie, with your particular program, I know there were some audible gasps in the room when you talked about being able to have a very specific campaign website. You know, a lot of times PR and communications is relinquished to a landing page somewhere that you're gonna get, you know, very shallow metrics for that evaluation. How were you able to kind of execute that and pull that off? And then what are the resources that you're gonna need on an ongoing basis to be able to manage that? And how do you work across the other channels of your communication to maintain that? Yeah, so um, we had almost two websites really. We had a public facing site and we also had um, a site which was specifically containing messages for partners. Um, so we really developed that to enable them to be the voice of the campaign. So quite often in terms of positioning, the government narrative can get you so far, but to get real traction, you need to work with and through those partners. And that was incredibly important for us. Um, so giving local areas free, easy, tried and tested resources that they could use um, quickly like that, um, put things out on social media, adapt them, tweak them to their local environments was, was really important. Um, and we, so because of the value of that and because of past learning from previous campaigns, we were able, we were able to secure that quite easily. Um, I think we have gov.uk content, um, which really sets the benchmark for how we um, present our work. I think we're starting in government communications to realize that we need to be a bit more sophisticated than that, particularly with campaigns. Um, so gov.uk actually worked with us to create. We didn't go outside of the rules of governance or anything like that. Um, but we were able to create a campaign page that had a bit of a heart and soul. Um, yeah. That's, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. Because, right, there are those preconceptions of when they're seeing something that's just government and when it isn't really authentic to the cause and the need and the driver that even when coming up in search, right? Yeah. It, it can be a, a deterrent from then being able to take that next step into getting that assistance. I think that's a brilliant element to the campaign, so well done. We'll open it up for some questions, and as we're going around with the mic for the first question, then I just wanna kind of reiterate, throughout all of these presentations, we were talking about a lot of data, we were talking about a lot of information across all of those channels, and nowhere was it fully automated, right? Everybody talked about the importance and the key that even though you're getting this data and even though artificial intelligence is intelligent, it's still an artificial component. And so never forget, whether it's your internal team, whether it's your company, that your mind and your critical thinking of things is the greatest asset to every endeavor that you take on. It's really so critical to you know, take it in perspective, but to layer over context with all of the information that comes in and understand that even in sourcing information, I know they were talking in an earlier session about the quality and the cleanliness of the data as it's coming in. And unless you know that 100%, turning that over to your client without some context, without some layered in effect can be really dangerous, especially when we look at getting this information leading to actions and outcomes for a company if you're just throwing junk at them, huge challenge, huge credibility issue, not just for your organization on this campaign, but for a company, for stock value, for real jobs that are in the marketplace. So you know, I would just challenge us all that as we venture into these waters of wanting to be more a part of what these outcomes are, that we're very mindful of, what that re of the responsibility that goes along with that and to, and to take those steps very cautiously. Do we have any questions from the audience, yes, we have one in the back, thank you. Hi there, this is uh, Daniel from Facebook. Um, this is session is about paid, earned, um, shared, and, and owned, so I'd be interested in the panelists' opinion of whether they've tried to 
assess the individual contributions of those four media um, involved in their campaigns or whether they even try to identify any synergies between them. Great question. Who would like to start us off? I mean, from, from our campaign, we look at it in the round. So the, the, measures, the measures that you see there are obviously one of several across in terms of, but for us it's really important. We don't run campaigns with huge budget. It's taxpayers' money. We need to really be smart about where we put it. So I think it's, it's an obvious one for us about where we put that investment and the return on that investment. So for each phase of, of the campaign that I alluded to and the channel shift that happened around moving more from sort of out of home advertising to more digital space where we're able to track it um, and be in the right place at the right moment. Um, yeah, that, that we kind of look at it in the round holistically. I think what can sometimes be difficult in government communications is not going down the road of, I suppose, vanity projects. So out of home advertising is a great thing because to a minister it's there and it's very visible. Um, and so there's some education we have to do as comms professionals to um, make people aware of, of what return that is giving. Um, and the work with partners is a great example of that. Lucas, Nadine, anything yeah. to add? Yeah, we actually did uh, the division between the various uh, paid, earned, shared, and owned media and looked into um, to, to, to the various uh, channels. But what we found was that nobody writes about uh, Fawcett. So <laughs> basically no earned courage. So we naturally turned our focus to, to the pay, uh, paid and, 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 uh, and shared uh, uh, channels. I think each one of these different channels have their own success metrics as well. So it's really important for each channel at the outset to really define what are we trying to achieve and then be able to follow that journey and really see if you're meeting those objectives. I think those are all great points. And you know, to the original question, we know now that decisions aren't made based on a single touch point. They aren't made based on a single data point either. And so it's not only that first point of influence, but what are those iterative points of influence? I mean, there's a reason why the retargeting advertising is such a huge market, right? Because they know that seeing it once doesn't create that action, seeing it twice doesn't stop you to go buy something. It's on average, you know, it used to be it was seven touch points would create that, that call to action and that you know, motivation to move you through the funnel. Now, and this is information that's probably three or four years old now, so I apologize, but I mean at the point, it was 27 touch points. So as our attention span narrows, you know, more and more people fighting for that space, and it's then going out and getting more and more touch points that they have to do to influence that. And that has to work across all channels, especially because of the trust factor that we see and how we all consume media. So it's increasingly important that we kind of take all of those into account and then there is that credibility factor for each one. We have time for one more question. Who will be the brave soul? <laughs> all right, I will ask the final question then. <gasps> Thomas, I said the brave soul, that's what convinced me. Okay, I'm Thomas Weilam in InfoMedia. Uh, first of all, I thank for all of you. Really nice presentations. I like the depth and also how you carefully uh, present and how proud you look uh, upon this, these, these nice deliveries. But a question in that direction. Uh, are, we, are we, you know, in the industry, are we getting, uh, uh, are we, are we getting this empowered enough at, at client side? My question is, is this a report over the table, or how was it delivered? Is it a presentation for the management team? And you know, do do, do they treat the uh, do they treat it well? Are we able to really to become kind of consultants when we deliver work like this? So I can take this. I think there's again. I think there's a lot more work to do. Um, we're certainly getting there, and clients are listening. But because of sometimes you know internal political. <laughs> situations, things are very slow to put into practice. And I think the message actually has to come from the C-suite to bring all of these functions together and then look at what are we trying to achieve as a brand as a whole and then how can each function contribute to that aspect and really come together and look at it holistically because otherwise everybody is just looking at what they are doing, giving themselves a pat on the back, brilliant, excellent, showing it to their bosses. But does it matter? 
Probably not. So I think you really need to look at what is the company as a whole trying to achieve and then send that message across to all of your team so they all work together. And it's a very, depending on the size of the organization, obviously the bigger the organizations and you work with some very large global organizations, the more difficult that process is. I think it was actually really encouraging and, and, and refreshing earlier on to uh, listen to Suzanne Sturton from Adobe. She was saying how the marketing and the communications teams, they work really well together and that's something we need to see more of. And certainly in government communications, yes. Um, we've got Alex, who is a force to be reckoned with. Um, and also just embedding that and making the worth of comms felt at a policy level. So the campaign that I showed and subsequent campaigns that I've worked on are absolutely about communications and the policy like that working together. Um, and these are shared successes. They're not just comms successes because of that. Um, and also a very, <laughs> a very important point in terms of how we govern it, but in, in UK government comms, if we don't have a robust plan and if we're not following that structure and an oasis and able to share with um, you know, Alex's central team, we won't get the money. So that's a real incentive <laughs> to make sure that policy teams um, on what they, what they need to deliver on behalf of the government, if there's a comms element to that, um, it better be the best comms element that it can be. So, yeah. Great. Thanks. Richard, anything to add? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I think what I would like to highlight from when we've been talking about in integration the past two days, um, from, from our perspective, I think the thing to highlight is that what we really are doing with, the, with the data integration is going from delivering information to delivering knowledge. And there's a vast difference between being an information um, provider and a knowledge provider. So what our client used the report, the, it was actually, it, it resulted in t three distinct um, strategic uh, recommendations and they've employed them throughout uh, their the work and, and had instant success uh, using all recommendations. So I think it's definitely the future is uh, bringing more and more data uh, into the mix. Fantastic. And before we give our panel a final round of applause, there's been a couple of housekeeping items. So at the conclusion of this session, unlike any other session, as promised, we are offering you drinks <laughs> outside of these doors. Um, we ask that uh, you will be very attentive to the closing remarks from our chair, Richard Bagnall, and the headline sponsor, Assesso, who without great sponsors, none of this is possible. And then the coaches will be picking us up outside the front, wherever the front of this building is. Good luck, you're ahead of me if you know that. Uh, the coaches will be picking everybody up for um, transport to the awards banquet tonight, which we wish everyone who is a finalist the best of luck. So with that, thank you so much, panel, for a great <laughs> end.